John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Now, most if you deal with Jehovah's Witnesses and things like that, you should be fully aware of the key text in the Gospel of John where Jesus is identified by the Greek phrase, ego I me, the emphatic I am or I myself am, which comes to us from the Old Testament, not from Exodus 3.14. It is in Exodus 3.14, but that's ego I me haon. I am the one being. I am the one existing. It's used as a euphemism for God, the name of God, especially in Isaiah. And so it's used in very important places in John 8, 24, John 8, 58. Most people do know John, most people know John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. In 8, 24, if you, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Very, very important. A lot of people know about John 18, 5 through 6. You know, the soldiers are coming to rest Jesus. Jesus says, who are you seeing? We're seeing Jesus. Jesus says, I am, ego, I, me. And then John makes sure that as soon as he says, I, I am, the soldiers fall back upon the ground. Now, if, if you ever want to just find out if a Unitarian has any honesty in them at all, hit them with that one. So why do soldiers fall back upon the ground when Jesus says, I am? And you come up, you read some of the most amazing statements. Well, when they were faced with Jesus's deep moral purity, they fell back upon the ground. It's out there. Honestly, I've read it. And you're just like, yeah, the, yeah Roman soldiers are always falling back on the ground when they encounter deep moral purity that's just it, it happens all in fact we've found ancient um roman soldier tush protectors because it just happens so often they design specific specific armor <laughs> get falling on the ground it's just so dumb you don't even know what to say to this kind of stuff but anyway uh most of us know the i am statements in those contexts and they're important they, they really are but there's one I am statement that most people are not aware of. They're just not aware of it. And it's important. It's beautiful. Uh, homeschool moms, you've got to find a way to teach your kids. <laughs> but I leave it up to you. Cupcakes could be used. Um, slices of pizza, whatever. Uh, whatever it takes. <laughs> this, is, this, is what you, this is what you do. John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, oh, yes, we, well, I, I guess I can go full screen on that. <clears throat> um, truly, truly, I say to you, a, la a slave is not greater than his master. The servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither the one sent, an apostolos, greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking concerning all of you. I know, I know which ones, and that's ex alexata, that's I have chosen. I know which ones, plural, I have chosen, but in order that hegrafe plerothe. Now, now, now you, you've got to, let me scroll this up here and let me, let me, yes, it will, it will work. When you encounter grafe plerothe, scripture fulfilled. Now you're dealing with something. That this isn't. This isn't. This isn't personal opinion. We're talking about the fulfillment of the scriptures here. Jesus said the scriptures cannot be broken. That's pretty important. And so, what are we going to do with this? Scriptures cannot be broken. Well, what is the scripture? What is the scripture might be fulfilled? The one eating my bread has lifted up his heel against me. So there is this theme in 
the Old Testament in the Psalter. There is, a, you know, how many times does uh, uh, David, for example, this is from Psalm 41, how many times does, does David talk about the ones close to him? The ones eating at my table. In other words, people who are close to me, my, my close fellows, betraying him. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. This is Jesus speaking. All right, this is Jesus speaking. So if you're going to call yourself a Christian or something, you you might want to be really careful going, well, you know, I'm not really sure this is really a prophetic passage. Hey, this is Jesus' interpretation. Or what you have to do is say, well, this is just John sticking words in Jesus' mouth. Whatever you do with this theology, you end up having to trash biblical inspiration. You just, it it's necessary. It happens over time. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. So we have in verse 18 a scripture fulfillment narrative. What does the very next verse say? Op RT, from now on, I am telling you before to Genestai, before it comes to pass. In order that when Hatan Genetai it comes to pass, you may pistuseta believe. Believe what? Hati ego aimi. That I am. Now I've told the story. So I apologize to all of you old timers. Rich has heard this story so many times, he's already repeating it in the other room because he, you know, knows what's coming. But I remember so clearly back about 1984, I think around 1984, second bedroom of our spacious two-bedroom apartment um, down there off of off of West Pasadena, Third Avenue. Um, the wife was already uh, asleep in bed. And I had one, I had this, I still remember this white desk lamp, little thing with those little round bulbs would burn out fairly frequently. And that wonderful, compact, portable computer with the dual floppy disks, no hard drive, but 640K of RAM. That was a lot of RAM before hard drives. Six inch green screen. It was portable. You could pick it up. You'd get a hernia, but you could pick it up. It's about the size of a, of a sewing machine. Nobody knows what a sewing machine is anymore either. Huh? It was a suitcase. It was the size of a suitcase. It was. It really was. And I was studying the I am sayings of Jesus. And I don't remember, my assumption is that I looked at John 13, 19. And I'm going, Ab arti lego humin pratu genestai. Hina pistuseta hatan genetai hati ego. I mean, that looks familiar. I've, I've seen that somewhere before. I, I don't I don't know. And I think I grabbed my my Greek Septuagint, my old Greek Septuagint, and I started thumbing through it and I said, where have I heard this before? Well, I'll show you where I heard it before. I heard it in a text that was apologetically partially memorized. <laughs> what does that mean? <clears throat> there are a lot of verses that apologists use where you only need to use a part of the verse. And in fact, if you try to use the whole verse, it's too long and it, you lose the advantage of citing it. And so you only cite a part of the verse and then you move on. Isaiah 43.10 is probably, it's one of the top three verses, I think, 
that most people memorize when dealing with Mormons. And it says, you are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, says the Lord. And my servant I've chosen. But you don't worry about all that part. Because what you want to get to is at the end of the verse, it says, before me, there is no God formed and there will be none after me. That's the end of the verse. But the problem is, that's just part of a sentence. You are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there is no God formed and there will be none after me. I, even I am Yahweh, and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there is no strange God among you, so you are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, and I am God, even from eternity, I am he. Now, over here is the Greek Septuagint. And it's interesting, my servant whom I have chosen, and then look back here to, right there. I know the ones I have chosen. Exelex Amen. And then you go to the Greek Septuagint. Oh, look, it's the same verb. You're my servant who I've chosen. In order that you may know and believe, exact same form of pistuseta, and understand that ego I me, I am. Both are in the context of prophecy. And Jesus plainly quotes the one where Yahweh is identifying himself as the I am. Jesus quotes it to his disciples in John chapter 13, verse 19, on the night of his betrayal. But in what context? But in what context? The context is saying, he who eats my bread is lifted up his heel against me. Now do you see what's going on? Jesus predicts his betrayal by Judas. And then he says, from now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am. Ego I me. Same phrase used in John 8, 24, 8, 58, 18, 5 to 6, 13, 19. The context of Jesus' self-revelation to his disciples, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you before it takes place. Because see, that's what the true God can do. Because the true God can do prophecy. He's not just predicting things. He's not just it's going, well, I got more information than anybody else does. So my predictions normally come true. Every open theist has to say there are false prophecies in scripture. That it's no big deal. Every open theist does it. They have to. They have to. But here's the question. What if Judas had changed his mind? What if Judas changed mind? Think about what that means. So God has this all set up. And I suppose you could say, well, you know, doing it around the time of Passover was nice, but God would be willing to take a couple month delay if he has to go to plan B, right? Right? I mean, that's where you have to go. You cannot have God accomplishing anything in this thing because there are too many free creatures running around that the open theists say, I did, nope, don't know, mm, I, didn't, I don't know. So, if Judas doesn't do it, theoretically, it would be possible that if God goes with the next person and then the next person, all of them refuse to do it. And there's no redemption, right? Lot. I mean, since we're doing the philosophical let's play games thing rather than going with scripture and its worldview, you'd have to say, boy, God was awful lucky to get the cross accomplished. Maybe God had been trying to get a, the, hey, maybe this is an explanation. God had been trying to get the Messiah crucified since Adam, but this is the first time he could make it work out. Why not? Why not? I mean, since we're playing this kind of speculative foolishness, why not? But what else does it mean? 
Jesus says, I'm telling you before it comes to pass that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. And then Judas goes out and says, I'm not going to do it. So what does that mean about Jesus? So that you may know and believe that I am he. Oh, oops. I false prophesied. Because Bob Enyart said, yeah, Judas could do that. Has to. But remember, Bob Enyart went so far as to say that Jesus could disobey the Father. For Bob Enyart, the free will of man is God. And the triune God could explode from internal incons inconsistency and disobedience on the part of the Son to the Father. But as long as the free will of man, we're good. It's another religion. Completely. It's nothing that any of the biblical authors have even dreamed of, obviously. So here you have Jesus putting his self-revelation as to who he is on the line. I am telling you before it comes to pass, Jesus can do that. Why? Because God's sovereign and man is not. That's why. And as soon as you invert that, and then try to be consistent, you will eventually have to leave the faith. You will eventually have to, because it's not going to work. It's just not going to work.